Uh, welcome to the annual Symposium on Mental Health in the Workplace. My name is Carol Dabritsky, and I am the Americans with Disabilities Act Coordinator for the University. I would like to acknowledge um, those attendees here at Palmer Commons today, and we had such a great response. This is also being uh, live webcast, so welcome to our uh, attendees who are visiting us and attending this presentation via their computer. Um, I would first like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the Office of Institutional Equity and M Healthy, with support from the Council for Disability Concerns. Um, the Council is sponsoring a number of very interesting and informative events this week for investing in abilities to raise awareness regarding disability issues. So now to the, um, the exciting part and the reason that we're all here. Our presentation today is On Purpose, Lessons in Life and Health from the Frog and the Dung Beetle. And our presenter is Dr. Vic Strecker. Dr. Strecker is a professor and director of innovation and social entrepreneurship at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Dr. Strecker received his PhD in health behavior and health education at the University of Michigan School of Public Health in 1983. Since 1995, Dr. Strecker has been a professor in the U of M School of Public Health and until 2009, Director of Cancer Prevention and Control at the U of M Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Strecker founded the U of M Center for Health Communications Research, which is a collaborative research-focused organization of health and behavioral scientists, educators, software engineers, and artists. Dr. Strecker and the organizations he founded have won numerous national and international awards. In 2010, Dr. Strecker won the University of Michigan's Distinguished Innovator Award and his School of Public Health's Award for Translating Research into Practice. Currently, as the newly appointed Director for Innovation and Social Entrepreneurship, Dr. Strecker is working in the School of Public Health to create an environment that promotes more direct dissemination of research and teaching efforts to improve the public's health nationally and globally. Please welcome Dr. Vic Strecker. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know that's an interesting title. Uh, I'm going to try to explain that as we move on. Um, about two years ago or so, I was up in northern Michigan, right on Lake Michigan, actually, and I looked out. It was about 5.15 in the morning. I woke up, and I couldn't sleep, and I noticed an unusual sight. Lake Michigan was calm. If you've been there, it's often roiling, but it was calm like just a gigantic plate of glass. It was absolutely beautiful, and the sun was just starting to peek out under the, under the lake. So. I thought, I'm just going to take my kayak and row out. And I did. I just rowed out straight out for about a mile. It was so calm, I, I didn't feel any danger at all. And I just kept going and going and going. And then I stopped for a while, and I started watching the sun come up. And as the sun came up, I started thinking, and it, it was almost this epiphany. I'm sure all of you have had these kinds of events where it's kind of a peak experience. Well, for me, the sun was coming up, and the water was dappling gold, and everything started just shining and glowing around me. And I started thinking about things in a new way. And I just started to, I, I made a decision out on the lake that I was no longer going to think the way I had before. I was no longer going to approach our field in health behavior and health education in the same way I had before. And I was going to start thinking about some problems that had been bugging me for a long time. So this is one of the problems that's bugged me for a long time, the boiling frog metaphor. Is everyone or anyone familiar with this boiling frog metaphor? If you've seen Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth or, you know, this is on left wing and right wing. Everybody talks about the boiling frog. The metaphor being that if you put a frog in boiling water, it jumps out right away. In other words, something sudden, you know, makes the frog jump out. Whereas if you put the frog in cool water and gradually increase the heat very gradually, the frog boils to death. Now, whether this metaphor is true or not, I'm not going to get into, although there is a whole set of studies in the 18th hundreds done by Johns Hopkins that are the most gruesome studies you will ever read in your life, and I'm more than happy to send these to you, where they actually were testing this boiling frog concept. Unbelievable. But this, to me, is a wonderful metaphor. Whether it's true or not, 
The metaphor uh, aptly describes many truisms in the field of public health and mental health, which is that as our sedentary behavior just gradually increases, as our waistline gradually increases, as our climate change gradually in, uh, uh, gets worse and worse, we just don't attend to it because it's so gradual. We're kind of all boiling frogs in a way. And, uh, and this metaphor really has bugged me for a long time because it is the metaphor of our society now. It is really what's happening in public health, and we need to do something about it. How do we do things about it? Well, we give people health risk appraisals. Now, I have nothing terribly against health risk appraisals. I've built many of them myself, um, and I know they're used here, and, and you know sometimes good things happen from these. But first of all, health risk assessments are not really health risk assessments because they use data looking at mortality and morbidity, disease and death, rather than health. So they really should be called death risk assessments, or DRAs. And the kind of feedback that they give you is, boy, you should quit smoking or you'll die. <laughs> you know, you should eat right or die, move more or die. It's, it really is a death risk assessment. And you know, it's funny because they pay people here at the University of Michigan to take these. Um, Health Media, the company that I founded, then taken over by, um, purchased by uh, Johnson & Johnson, they pay people $500 a person to take these health risk appraisals. What product do you know that you have to pay people to take? I mean, that's crazy. Why do we have to pay people to do this? Well, because somehow they're not resonating. And that's what I was thinking about out on the lake. It's just not resonating with us. That's, that's one of the big issues. So I started this little thought exercise of teaching a class, a metaphorical class, where I started asking questions such as, what is health? Can anybody define health for me? And one of the students, whenever I do this in my real classes, somebody always says, life expectancy. That's, that's really what's going on. So not dying, basically, living a long life. And so that would be the country of Japan. Japan has the longest life expectancy in the world. They also have, right now, I think it's about the fifth highest suicide rate in the world. So somebody in the class, an elderly student, says, you know what? It's not the years in your life. It's the life in your years that's really important. And so I go, well, where are you from? You know, that's different. He goes, Costa Rica. Ah, Costa Rica, pura vida, pure life. That's their slogan in Costa Rica. They have had, over the last 10 years, the highest life satisfaction rate in the world. The highest life satisfaction rate in the world. They live very differently than people in Japan do. I'm not saying Japan's bad. They have very high life expectancy. But the fact that they have this, this um, very high suicide rate, high depression rate, the fact that our country has the highest depression rate in the world, the fact that the Netherlands, a wonderful country to live in, ha also has a very high depression rate, makes me nervous and a little bit queasy about how we're really defining health. Mark Twain said that the fear of death follows from a fear of life. Now that's intriguing, and I go to, back to Mark and go, you know what, Mark Twain, that's all we talk about here in public health. We talk about death. We talk about disease, and we talk about death. That's what we like to do. Um, our number one journal is Morbidity and Mortality Weekly. <laughs> that comes from the Centers for Disease Control. So that is our Bible for public health. So absolutely, we follow death, we follow disease. Is that the right track? Here's another article, and this is something that we really follow a lot in the behavioral sciences because it, as well as many articles, state that 55% of all deaths are related to our decisions that we make. You know, whether we smoke or not, how we eat, how we work out, things like that. All of that is important. And look at how the arrows are aimed. The arrows are aimed from something that you're doing bad, your lifestyles, your personal decisions, leading to a cause of death, which then leads to a medical cause of death, which causes, you know, leads to death. In other words, something like diet leads to being overweight, leads to all these illnesses. This is the public health model. This is, pre and the medical model for that matter. We look at things, our behaviors, and then we say, if you don't change that behavior, then this bad thing will happen, and then this bad thing will happen, then you will die, right? And so when we decide to help people quit smoking, 
we decided to put scary images on the pack of cigarettes. Now, by the way, we've gone well beyond just the warning label. Now the FDA is considering having a dead person with staples going down their chest uh, laying down on a, on a morgue table. Uh, people smoking out of their trach tubes. You know, standard. This is like, it's kind of we've slapped these people up enough, and now we've gotten, you know, no response from them. Why? Because they're totally inoculated to these messages. And then we try to ratchet it up, and we keep getting worse and worse. We keep trying to scare people more and more because we're following those arrows. And that's what's key to me. So the big question is, how do I get this frog out of the boiling water? If we were just on the outside of this bowl, we all are right now. We're on the outside. What are we going to tell this frog? It's our natural inclination to say, frog, get out or you will die. Get out. This is boiling water. Are you kidding me? This is dangerous. Your risk of death is very, very high now, and it's going up. What would the frog say? The frog would say, what do you know? Are you an expert on boiling water? This water isn't so hot. Now go away. I'm getting kind of sleepy. In other words, the frog would, first of all, question your credibility. That's source credibility. They'd question, do you really know what you're talking about? Think about climate change. Think about any of these other behaviors that are boiling frog issues that we have in our society. This is what we say. And then we deny it, too. This water isn't getting so hot. Now go away. So pretty much that's what we like to say. So this all reminds me of my second grade teacher, Ms. Schneider, and I am using her real name because she was the worst, <laughs> most horrible teacher that I've ever had in my whole life. And I hope she's still alive, and I hope she's watching this webcast. <laughs> so Ms. Schneider, my second grade teacher, would say, so why can't we get the frog out this way? And I might go, uh, because you're so gross. And, um, and she would then, of course, whap me. Wrong answer, Victor. And, um, and I'd say, ouch, OK. So now I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why, and it's because we're all defensive. It's, we're defensive because we have this big, it's almost like having a castle wall around our heads. And as we keep trying to force messages into this castle wall, a lot of us are educators here. We're trying to force these messages through the castle wall by scaring the crap out of the person. What happens? The wall just gets thicker. You know, the stones just get bigger. And so it's harder and harder to get this person to even see out of this. Now, by the way, a lot of people call this castle wall the ego. The ego is something, and, you know, Eckhart Tolle, and, you know, kind of a, a, a pop philosopher or whatever, but he's, he's, I mean that in a good sense. He's a popular philosopher. He calls the ego the devil. But so does Buddha. Buddha talks about removing the veil. Just about every major religion and spiritual movement talks about having this self that is not real, that we project, that we believe in ourselves. We stay in this castle wall, and increasingly, we're able to stay in this castle wall. And we're all defensive. I am, all of you are, we all have defensiveness, and to some extent, it's helpful. It's really helpful to be somewhat defensive, or you'd be led you know, everywhere by every new movement, by every suggestion. Of course, we need some defensive wall. But now I think we have a big problem in our society that we all have big, very thick castle walls. And so a big question, again, is you know, if we're giving a person a health message or any kind of message, how do we get them to consider the message, rather than just simply rejecting it outright like this frog is, and, uh, so that we can help the person make a, a, an important change in their life? One way might be to open the drawbridge of the castle wall. So every once in a while, just maybe once a week, maybe if you're a right-wing person, maybe you could listen to Rachel Maddow. And if you're left-wing, maybe once a week for half an hour, and I know this disgusts many of you in the left, maybe just watch Bill O'Reilly for half an hour. Just listen. Why are they so angry? Why is the right so angry, the Tea Party so angry? Why is the left so upset and indignant? There are many reasons of this, and sitting down and listening to people just for even half an hour a week might not be a bad idea. Just open the drawbridge, let some of these people in under armed guard. You know you can turn off the television. You know you can leave this person. It's okay. Um, they won't hurt you. But that's the thing. You know, you're kind of saying, they might hurt me. Hurt meaning change. They might actually change your opinion about something or broaden your perspective. I have this theory now that when in the 1960s and 70s when I was growing up, 
We had three channels on television, and really there's one major news host, and his name was Walter Cronkite. And when Walter Cronkite came back from, and pretty much everybody watched Walter Cronkite, and when people came, when he came back from the Vietnam War after interviewing soldiers, he said, I don't know if this war is a good idea. That's what he said on television. And suddenly we stopped the war. It was as simple as that, because everybody kind of listened to the same thing. Now what do we have? We have the Huffington Post, we have Blaze, we have Fox, we have MSNBC, we have anything you want to stay in your castle wall. We can sit in our wall all day and night and do nothing but listen to things that agree with us. That's it. I mean, we're dead if that's the case. We will never, ever talk to anybody else who disagrees, who may have a different opinion, as long as we keep moving in this direction. Now, there's a new book, actually, called The Filter Bubble, which is all about this. And it's all about something called tailoring. And this is something that I've built a lot of my career, and our center has built a lot of career around tailoring. And they say, you know, as we tailor news media to people, we dig our rut deeper and deeper. Now, my wife warned me about this 20 years ago. She's an artist, and she's right over there. Jerry said, by the way, Vic, as you tailor, you're going to be digging ruts deeper and deeper. They'll never get a chance to explore something new. Now, of course, in our programming, we allow people to explore new things, to open the library to them. But you know, if you think about the news media, that's all we're doing, tailoring increasingly. Google is now your Google. It's not the same as my Google. The messages you get are totally different. It's based on you and N of 1. So we're tailoring things so that we're allowed to stay in our castle wall. Let's open that up. So that's one way we could think about getting through this castle. Another way is when the castle wall breaks open. The castle wall can break open when suddenly you lose your job, when you have a death of a loved one, when you have a divorce, when something significant happens, when you get sick. Working in the cancer center for 15 years, I discovered so many people who, once they had cancer, their ego wall broke open. Suddenly, they, they didn't have those same defenses, that deep castle wall, and they saw things much differently. This is Ram Dass, who was a psychologist at Harvard, and he changed his name to Ram Dass, and he became a, a Buddhist spiritual advisor. And Ram Dass is very impressive. When he was in his 60s, he suffered a major stroke. Here's what he said. This stroke was an act of grace for me. Now that my ego is broken open, I can see who I really am. That's pretty amazing. You see a lot of cancer patients that way. You see a lot of people who have lost somebody who suddenly see a little more clearly and are going, wow, I have to do something. There's a wonderful book by Elizabeth Lesser called Broken Open. It's one of the best books to read if something significant has happened to you because it's basically saying, what can you do to change your life and think about things in a new way if something bad has happened to you? When Steve Jobs knew he had pancreatic cancer, he knew he was going to die, he gave the commencement address at Stanford. Here's what he said, death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. That's a pretty interesting thing to say at a commencement address to a bunch of 20-somethings. You know, death is the, very likely the single best invention of life. So Epicurus actually said, as far as death is concerned, we men live in a city without walls. Nice. The metaphor holds. And I would say that's absolutely true. So I started looking and researching this idea, because this is philosophy, right? And you know, I grew up thinking, OK, philosophy, fine. It's a bunch of people who are smart or pretend who are, that, that they're smart. And are they really saying things that are smart? Are they saying things that are true, saying things that are wise? So I'm a scientist, and I like to look at scientific data. Well, here's some scientific data where uh, entitled Death, Life, Scarcity, and Value, where they had college students start thinking more about their deaths. And as they start thinking more about their deaths, they actually started valuing their life more. And they use an econometric model, and here's the model. If you have $5 in your pocket and you're walking down State Street and somebody on the street is asking you for a couple bucks, it's kind of hard to give that couple bucks when you only have five bucks in your wallet, right? If you have $10,000 in your wallet and somebody asks you for a couple bucks, fine, no problem, here's a 20. No problem. So it's much easier. Now think about that in terms of years of life that you might have. So for example, Marcus Aurelius, a great Stoic philosopher who also happened to be the best emperor that ancient Rome ever knew, said, do not act as if you were going to live 10,000 years. Death hangs over you while you live, while it's in your power, be good. 
Marcus Aurelius and the rest of the Stoics would wake up every morning and assume they were going to die that day. That was part of Stoic training. Wake up in the morning, assume you're going to die. Kiss your child at night and assume that he or she will die through the night. Morbid, maybe. At the same time, what these people did then is live their life much more fully that day. Every single day they started living more fully with their children and with their family and with themselves. Really interesting philosophy 2,000 years ago that we have somehow failed to continue to acknowledge. We're much more afraid of death than the Stoics ever were. So again, Mark Twain said the fear of death follows from a fear of life. That's a very Stoic comment to, to have made. Now, is there a third way? We've talked about one, open the drawbridge every once in a while. We all have these castle walls called egos that protect ourselves, right? We need to protect ourselves, but maybe not that much. We could open the castle wall and see more clearly. We can also break open. We don't want to break open, right? We don't want catastrophic events to happen to us. We all understand that. So what could you do instead that's more meaningful than just opening up and watching Bill O'Reilly half an hour a week, uh, more uh, and, and, and less catastrophic or tragic than having your castle wall break open. Is there another way? Well, I know in the back you might not be able to see this, so I'll just read this. Self-affirmation reduces smokers' defensiveness to graphic on-pack cigarette warning labels. Another one, don't derogate this message. Self-affirmation promotes online Let's say I can barely see. Online, type 2 diabetes, risk test taking, yes. So in other words, people were more likely to take a health risk assessment. They are more likely to intend to quit smoking by about 40 percent, by the way, if at first they wrote down core values that they felt they had. Core values like, I believe in my family, I believe in my children, I want to be a good father, I want to be a good communitarian core values that you might have, even some values like I want to be attractive, I want to have be strong, I want to be in control, I want to whatever. And we'll get into different kinds of core values in just a few minutes. But right now I want us to say these studies had people writing down their core values in one group and in another group they wrote down things like the um, uh, routine events of the week. You know, what, what news events occurred over the week. In other words, a control condition. Then they showed both of them graphic warning labels, and they found that the people who had just written about these core values were significantly more likely to accept that and then to intend to change, and in fact, actually change. Why? Why does just simply writing down your core values, which is what people call self-affirmation, so you're affirming yourself by writing these down, why does writing down your core values seem to reduce defensiveness? Why does saying, I'm a good mother, I'm a good spouse, I'm in control, I'm attractive, lead this person to start actually considering quitting smoking? That's the big question. So it turns out somebody wrote this article. Why does writing about important core value or important values reduce defensiveness? Jennifer Crocker was a psychologist right here at the University of Michigan when she did this um, study. And it's a fascinating study. What she found, first of all, is it is true. When people are writing down their core values, they're less defensive. But a lot of people thought that all you're doing is kind of, if, if, if defensiveness is kind of like an equalizer, or your self-esteem is an equalizer, and what you're doing by affirming your core values is just increase your self-esteem, then you can slip something underneath the bar that's negative, that's kind of scary, right? It's almost like there's this equalizer. And we could call that a homeostatic approach to this because you always have to main, you know, you're maintaining a homeostasis of esteem and she didn't find that at all. That's what most people have thought so far, that, that this is just a homeostatic process. What she did find is as people were writing down their core values, they started becoming self-transcendent. Now what does that mean? Self-transcendence. This is something that's bigger than yourself. Suddenly, you're thinking about things bigger than yourself. Jenny Crocker found that suddenly you're thinking about love or compassion or empathy or bigger things, things bigger than ourselves, self-transcendent activities. And in a way, what we're doing then is levitating, rising above our castle wall. So suddenly we're starting to move up above it rather than having to have it break down. We're starting to lift up and seeing reality because reality is just outside of your castle wall. So that's what she found, that defensiveness is reduced 
as a result of this self-transcendent behavior. So I started exploring this concept more, self-transcendence, Jenny. I talked to her quite a, quite a while about this. What do you know about self-transcendence? Well, you know, it's a psychological construct. Well, yeah, but what's the history of self-transcendence? Oh, I don't really know a lot about it. Interesting, okay, so as part of my own journey, my quest, I decided to start learning more about self-transcendence, and I started with this little ancient character called the dung beetle. I have always, since a child, been impressed with this dung beetle because they, they are, look at how they have something much bigger than themselves. The other thing is I didn't like the word self-transcendence. You know, it seems so, you know, hoity-toity. And when I started thinking about that word of self-transcendence, I thought, what's the lowest creature on the planet? Or one of the lowest, you know? So the flatworm goes, you know, that, that rates. Um, but I thought the dung beetle's pretty cool uh, in that sense, too, because the dung beetle sits on a top of feces, uh, a big chunk of feces, and rolls this ball. After they roll a ball, and by the way, my wife can attest, I have five books about dung beetles um, in my office now, and I've been spending a lot of time reading about it and then talking to other, bi uh, to evolutionary biologists, especially one from the University of Western Australia, who's the world's dung beetle expert. And I said, tell me about what a dung beetle does after they roll the ball. He said, they do a handstand. A handstand, what do you mean? They do a handstand and they release a pheromone that attracts other dung beetles, female dung beetles. And these female dung beetles go, wow, nice ball. Um, and they literally do, because they look at the roundness, the sphere, uh, sphericity of the uh, dung ball, because they're going to have to roll the ball for quite a while. And they look at whether this dung beetle that they're latching onto is going to hook up with um, can also defend itself, because they're going to end up having to roll this ball in a relatively straight line for up to 100 yards. Imagine a little dung beetle this big rolling all the way across this room even. And then often there are little cliffs, little valleys that the dung ball falls down. A biologist named Fabre from the 1800s in France studied these for 20 years and he found that the dung beetle will roll the ball back up the hill up to six dozen times before giving up. They, are, they have a purpose. They have a mission, and they are self-transcending because they're looking at something that's much larger than themselves, this dung ball, right? That's their purpose. So after they decide in some preordained area to stop, they dig a hole, they bury the dung ball, they have incredible tantric, slow <laughs> dung beetle sex. <laughs> yes, and it's true, if you've ever seen films, which I have, of dung beetles <laughs> stooping, this is quite an amazing thing to watch. Uh, it's, it's pretty romantic. So anyway, they have dung beetle sex, and then the female lays the dung beetle eggs inside in the middle of the dung ball, and the larvae eat the dung ball out, hence that's their purpose, really to generate this, this new, new group. So let's think about self-transcendence then in terms of this dung beetle. I started looking around for other um, uh, corollaries of this dung beetle. And one thing that I found, I love to go to the British Museum. I'm in, in London a fair amount of times and a number of times. And when I'm in London, I always go to the British Museum. And I always hang out for some reason in the Egyptian collection, in part because it's the best Egyptian collection in the world, even better than Egypt, because the Brits stole everything from the, the Egyptians in the 17 and 1800s and moved it all up to the British Museum. So it's an enormous collection. And it's absolutely fascinating because these these statues and the pillars and other things are sometimes three, four thousand years old. Really unbelievable. And so I started looking at this and I started looking at the different amulets, I started looking at different hieroglyphs, and I started realizing, wow, these are dung beetles. This scarab is the dung beetle. This is the scarab god. The scarab god is named Kepri. And this is one of their most ancient gods and also the most sustaining god that they had. The very first sentence in the Egyptian Book of the Dead praises Kepri. Kepri is the Egyptian god um, related to transformation, to rebirth, and transcendence, oddly enough. So I didn't know that when I just started on this trek thinking about uh, dung beetles, but suddenly I realized that the Egyptians understood this. And if you look at this photograph that I took on the right, you see literally the dung beetle with this ball rising above what looks like a castle wall to me. 
I mean, it's pretty amazing. So I just had to take this photo. But you see this everywhere. You see uh, over 100 of these in the British Museum. Um, so I started thinking about this. Kepri, the, the scarab god, rolled the sun up every morning. That was Kepri's job, a Sisyphean kind of job. But the idea was that we can be reborn every morning. Imagine, you know, a, an entire incredible civilization like the ancient Egyptians deciding we're going to take this little dung beetle and turn him into uh, this god of rebirth, transformation, and transcendence. I was fascinated by this, quite honestly. So it turns out, in looking more at self-transcendence, that Maslow talked about this. Abraham Maslow was the father of humanistic psychology. He wrote a lot in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 60s. But he wrote a lot about something on what he called the top of the pyramid, which was self-actualization. So after you have all of your other needs met, you start thinking about your own human potential and how to reach your highest human potential. And you call that self-actualization. You talked about people having peak experiences. Now, a lot of people have criticized it because it turns out you can be a self-actualizer and still not have many of these needs met. You look at a lot of uh, Vedantic Hindus who, have, you know, who lack many of these needs and yet have certainly self-actualized. You see a lot of this around the world. If you travel, travel to developing countries, you find very self-actualized people who are not at this top of a, a modern Western type of pyramid. On the other hand, I think he, it, what he said made a lot of sense about self-actualizers. But after a while, he started saying, you know what? There's something beyond self-actualizers. When he is in, older in age, he, he discovered that many of the self-actualizers who were really focused on their own human potential were also and gradually evolving into being interested in humans' potential. Not just their own human potential, but human beings' potential, our society's potential. How could we do things? And, and these people thought much bigger than themselves. Maslow said a few things about self-transcenders. He said that transcenders find it easier to transcend the ego, what we've just been talking about, this castle wall that kind of, of defensiveness that surrounds us, the self, the identity. To go beyond self-actualization, these people are doing something bigger than just their own self, uh, focused on just them, themselves. Transcendence, transcendence is likely found in the, and I've got to read, I'm sorry, with my glasses because I'm friggin' old. Um, found in highly creative or talented people, in highly intelligent people, in very strong characters, in powerful and responsible leaders and managers, in exceptionally good, virtuous people, and in heroic people. Read Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, by the way. Heroic people who have overcome adversity and who have been strengthened by it rather than weakened by it. Maslow also said that transcenders are far more apt to be innovators and discoverers of the new. Why? Because they're not in their castle wall anymore. They can, in transcending and things about, thinking about a purpose and things that are bigger than themselves, they start thinking about things in a new way. As Ram Dass had said, if the castle wall breaks open, I can see more clearly now. They become the innovators in the world. Finally, and very, very importantly, transcenders have a sense of humility, a sense of ignorance, a feeling of smallness, a feeling of awe before the tremendousness of the universe. Think about our greatest scientists. I would argue that our very greatest scientists actually have this sense of humility, a sense of ignorance, a sense of awe. They don't know everything. In fact, they're learning a lot by the things that are the negative results in their findings. They go, oh my gosh, I thought that would happen. I didn't. Their castle wall just broke open. They're seeing more clearly. And suddenly, they're doing things that are innovative and new because they're not following the, the old school. Very important. So Maslow also wrote all about management later in his life. And so he started saying, identify the transcenders. The transcenders can see other transcenders. The transcenders are the innovators. Help them help other people transcend. So. There's another study that had just come out with Jennifer Crocker and Alea Burson, who was a doctoral student here, and I'm not sure if she's still here, and I'm not sure whether she's even watching this. I hope she is, but she, she had a wonderful study uh, with Jenny Crocker where they're looking at two kinds of self-value uh, affirmation. And I'll, I'll explain that to you. They took 92 college students from the University of Michigan. They had these college students write out their name, gender, information on an information sheet, and then they said, 
said, there are two other people, just follow me here, there are two other people in a triad, all three of you are writing these information sheets. I'm gonna give you the sheets from two other people and you pick the one you would like to work with because in the study we're only gonna take two. So one of you will kind of be booted out, so to speak, by the other two. Does that make sense? Okay, this is all totally faked, by the way. They never did any of this. All they did was either tell people, um, you weren't picked by the other two. Wow, bummer. Ego threat, right? So you weren't picked for the basketball team. You weren't picked to be part of this group who's gonna work on such and such. So your ego is threatened, right? Or no ego threat, you weren't actually, uh, oh, you were picked by the other two, but we decided to just randomly uh, select who was going to be part of this and you were randomly selected to go alone. So that's a control condition, right? Now we know, by the way, from about six studies that people who have an ego threat like this are more likely to uh, smoke more cigarettes, are more likely to exercise less, and are more likely to eat more, especially eating more. So when your ego is threatened, and it will be today, can almost guarantee it. Everybody's ego is threatened every once in a while. And as it's threatened, you will eat more, or at least want to eat more, okay? So that was one of the tests they wanted to engage in. But here's what they did in both groups, the ego threat group and the no ego threat group. They had them write out either the daily routine in both groups, that's a control condition, right? Or they had them write out their values. And they broke those values out into two kinds of values, self-transcending values. These are things like empathy, support needs, things that are bigger than yourself, what we've just been talking about, your family, your community, things that are bigger than yourself, maybe the scientific knowledge in the world, relationships, or self-enhancing values. Think Charlie Sheen values. You know, so power, wealth, independence, crack cocaine, attractiveness, <laughs> prestige, whatever, you know. These are things that, uh, that people value, but they're called self-enhancing values. So a big question is, is there a difference? That's what Jenny Crocker and Aaliyah Burson wanted to find out. That's a very good question. So if we're having people just write down a bunch of values, the question is, are some more important than others, right? Okay, so here's what they found. The real test in this whole thing, the real manipulation was, we have these fresh chocolate chip cookies. They just came out of the oven. Um, and there's this other experiment we're doing too. I don't know if you want to be part of this experiment, 92 college students from the University of Michigan, but we do have these warm chocolate chip cookies we need taste tested. Do you mind? You can have as many as you want. Oddly enough, 92 out of 92 said, yep, I'm in, I'm in this study, great, no problem. So this is a real study. How many chocolate chip cookies did they eat, right? Now, we already know, and I already suggested, if you're just threatening your ego, this control condition should be compared to this control condition. Ego threat in green, uh, no ego threat in red, correct? So that's the first test we'd want to do here. And sure enough, we find that people with the ego threat ate eight cookies on average, and people with the no ego threat ate four cookies. You notice when your ego is not threatened, didn't matter whether you're writing down values or not, it's when your ego is threatened. It's when you feel threatened. It's when your castle wall is under siege, right? So let's look at that. So that's the initial test. Check. Six other studies, fine, no big deal. Here's the other one that we wanted to look at. Just basic self-affirmation theory. Do writing down core values work better than not writing down core values? Yes, they do. So these two groups together are statistically significantly greater than this group. Okay, now the big acid test, are some values more important than others? This test, right? Sure enough, statistically significant. People ate almost half the number of cookies if they were writing transcendent values. Still better if you're writing down any value, but better if you write down transcendent values. Does this make sense so far? Okay. So there's another study fairly recently done, 2009, called The Path Taken, Consequences of Attaining Intrinsic and Extrinsic Aspirations in Post-College Life. I'm bringing this up because we are in college. So um, these were college seniors at the University of Rochester. Before they graduated, they were asked to write down their core values in their life. And it factor analyzed or separated out into two groups. One group had individuals writing mainly about these self-enhancing values, power, I want money, I want fame, I want to look better, et cetera. Those are self-enhancing values. The other group, self-transcending values. I'm interested in my community. I'm interested in being a good partner. I'm interested in those types of things, okay? Here's what they found. 
Whoops. Um, here's what they found, and I can just read this to you real quickly. Results indicated that placing importance on either intrinsic or extrinsic, extrinsic meaning the self-enhancing values, the Charlie Sheen values. I'm sorry, if Charlie's watching this, my apologies. Don't sue me. Um, uh, extrinsic al uh, aspirations related positively to attainment of these goals. In other words, whatever goals you set when you're a college senior, you are more likely to attain those than if you didn't set them. That's great. Okay, goal setting works. Yet, whereas attainment of intrinsic aspirations related positively to psychological health, not just psychological health, it turned out physical health as well two years later. There's a follow-up study to this and also found physical health improvements. Attainment of extrinsic aspirations did not. Indeed, attainment of extrinsic aspirations related positively to indicators of ill-being of depression, of anxiety, of stress, and of physical illness. So they attain these things, and then suddenly they got sick. That's pretty interesting to me. So there may be better values than others. There's one thing in, uh, that I'm purposely not dealing with in this uh, presentation, and that is, should we, uh, who gives us these values? Does God give us these values, or could evolution have built these values? And there actually there is wonderful data that suggests that evolution could have built these values, that empathic, altruistic behavior can be evolutionarily, biologically selected for on the savanna. We know that bonobos, that chimps, that dolphins, that even rats exhibit empathic behavior. Even young children who are in their early months before they have any real socialization, so to speak, that we know of, exhibit empathic behavior. They only stop after the parents start trying to get them to engage in empathic behavior, and that's true. So Viktor Frankl, who spent time in three concentration camps, saw people dying everywhere around him. And what he found, he's a psychiatrist, and what Viktor Frankl found is that before they died, and this is even before they were sick, they lost their purpose in life. So he started talking about this in terms of self-transcendence. And he said, in, regarding self-transcendence, man's life always points to something beyond himself. It is always directed toward a meaning to fulfill. So let's think about that meaning or purpose. Let's, let's look at four people. Simone de Bavier, who was a partner to uh, uh, Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre. Soren Kierkegaard, uh, and by the way, Simone de Bavier was a, a devout atheist. Soren Kierkegaard was a very religious person. George Bernard Shaw, atheist. Frederick Nietzsche, there is no God, atheist. That's one of his famous quotes. So Simone de Bavier, and I'm just pointing out their background, said it can be anything. It could be religious or non-religious. Okay, all, all of them, though, were related to a philosophy called existentialism. So Mont de Boivier said, there is only one solution if old age is not to be an absurd parody of our former life, and that is to go on pursuing ends that give our existence a meaning. In other words, what she is saying is that we need a purpose, whether it is meaningful or not. Kierkegaard said, the thing is to find a truth, which is true for me, to find the idea for which I can live and die. He spent a long time talking about how hard it is and how important it is to identify that purpose in one's life. George Bernard Shaw said, we should all be obliged to appear before a board every five years and justify our existence on pain of liquidation. <laughs> a little harsh there, George, but all he's saying is that we should be justifying our existence, justifying our purpose. And then Friedrich Nietzsche said, he who has a why can live for and can bear almost any how. That's really interesting. In other words, if I have a why or a purpose to live, I can live through just about anything. Viktor Frankl certainly found that. So the purpose can drive you through things. It can drive you through barriers. In our field, we spend a lot of time trying to address people's barriers to quitting smoking, to eating right, or to whatever. But Nietzsche is saying if you have a strong enough motive or purpose in your life, these things can go away. And there's some, some new thought about that that seems to really make sense in some good data. So let's look at meaning and life. Neil Krauss, who's a professor here in our School of Public Health at the University of Michigan, studied this with uh, the National Aging Study. And what he found is that people who had a purpose in life indeed live longer. 
And in fact, it's not just meaning in life, but there's a subscale that was purposeful. It was related to purpose in life. That's a, kind of a subset of meaning in life. Uh, and it was that purpose that really related to living longer. Here's another. People who are elderly, I'll just read this, effect of a purpose on life on risk of incident Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment in community dwelling older persons. These people are starting out just fine to begin with. And then thus, a person with a high score on purpose in life was approximately, get this, 2.4 times more likely to remain free of Alzheimer's disease than was a person with a low score. They followed people for seven years. What if we had a drug that did that? It'd be in our water system. We'd be drinking it now with our coffee. It'd be little tablets we'd be putting on our coffee. It's unbelievable. In other words, you can go back to the first one. You live longer. You are less likely to get Alzheimer's disease. This predicts uh, success with cocaine treatment. I'll just read this. Purpose in life was unrelated to cocaine or alcohol use during six-month pre-treatment. So this is before they got in. After controlling for age, baseline use, and depressive symptoms, purpose in life was significantly predicting relapse, meaning lower relapse, to any use of cocaine or alcohol. And the number of, well, I won't get into it, but findings suggest that increasing purpose in life may be an important aspect of treatment among cocaine-dependent patients. Here's another one. A higher sense of purpose is associated with sexual enjoyment in midlife women. Nice. Okay. So, higher sense of purpose is associated with more enjoyment, sexually intimate activities, adjusting for all these other known factors. I can send you any of these articles. It's pretty fascinating. So, uh, having a purpose is uh, associated with lower coronary heart disease at a two-year follow-up. Now, why is all this the case? Well, here's a fascinating study run by uh, in, one of the authors is Elizabeth Blackburn. Elizabeth Blackburn is a 2009 Nobel laureate out of Berkeley in medicine, so very well-known person. And she... Um, was she won the Nobel Prize for looking at people's chromosomes and discovering that the ends of our chromosomes are kind of like the aglets or little plastic things at the end of our shoelaces. She called them, or they are called telomeres, and she found that telomeres are protective. They protect the unraveling of our chromosomes. So telomerase is an enzyme that helps fuel these telomeres, and Elizabeth Blackburn won the Nobel Prize for this. What she then did, though, was put people into a meditation program. She had two groups. One was the meditation program for three months of meditation. The other was three months on the waiting list, waiting to get into the meditation program. But they're similar people, right? Okay, so a waiting group. But the, she found that the meditators, as she had hypothesized, had greater telomerase activation. In other words, their telomeres were repairing more. Interesting. I mean, you, you, we need to go back to evolution to try to figure out what's going on there. But she found certainly that as, people's, uh, as people were meditating more, they had greater telomerase repair. But here is the interesting part. The real mediator in this relationship that explained almost 100% of the relationship was that these meditators were developing a stronger purpose in their life. So it wasn't the meditation. It was the purpose in life that was built up in this experimental design. That, to me, is fascinating. So a lot of these could be associations, and you could say, well, you know, people who have a purpose are different kind of people. Yeah, we get that. But you know, no matter what people tried to adjust for statistically, here's an actual experiment where they tried an intervention that related to meditation. So let's think about this and what we could do with the general population. What if we could get people at the University of Michigan or in our society to start transcending, to start thinking about bigger values in their lives? What if they all had these balls that were, uh, you know, dung in a way, that were inflated and they were transcending above our defensiveness and we started thinking about how that could help in our lives? Let's say a person who is working here says, I want to be a role model for working moms. That's a great purpose to have in your life, right? And then you could look at what's underneath there, community, generosity, integrity. This is her root system of values that support this tree. And the dung ball is kind of, in a way, fueling these values. And then what does that fuel? It fuels your life. 
So let's say this is a, a person who's a custodial person here at the University of Michigan or in a school system. And in this elementary school, he's giving the children in his school a clean building and he's serving God. That's his purpose in life. Now, if he is very connected to the school like that, do you think he's going to have higher average or lower absenteeism rates in that school? I'm just guessing lower. I don't have data on this, but it might be a nice study that once you start helping people develop a stronger purpose or mission that's even associated with that elementary school, would you have higher average or lower absenteeism rates? Another might be from a cancer patient. I paint pictures that express the emotions of my breast cancer experience. I was just in New York talking to a person who's a Harvard physician who runs a foundation for art and healing. And he talks about the stories or the paintings or the art, the poetry, the dance, other people do who've just had cancer, who've just gotten back from the Iraq or Afghanistan war, anybody who has some sort of significant event happen to them, and he says they have a trauma narrative that they need to share with other people. And this is her trauma narrative. So that trauma narrative comes out and it's healing. It's almost like a poison is in you and you have to vomit it out. But at the same time, it's important to be sharing and listening to other people's trauma narratives at the same time. You can have a mission or purpose in a family. This is an actual family mission written by a family to maintain an environment where each of us can find support and encouragement in creating a better society. Imagine that family getting together over the gathering place of the dinner table and you say, what is our mission? What is our mission as a family? Do we have one? You know, who does that? How cool could that be? Let's look at this in terms of organizations. You know, Emil Durkheim, Max Weber. Max Weber coined the term bureaucracy. Um, these guys were thinking a lot about modernization and the problems of modernization. So that's why Charlie Chaplin wrote a, you know, had a movie, filmed a movie called Modern Times. And in that Modern Times, he was a cog in a wheel. So we know that with modernization, GDP has increased significantly in our country, as has, it has in all modern countries. We know that increased, there's been a significant increase in money. We also know that in the United States, satisfaction in life has not increased at all during those same times. From 2020 to modern times right now, we have not increased the satisfaction in our lives, even though we're far wealthier in, individually as we were in 1920. One might disagree with that, but the data is there. It's very clear. So this, to me, is fascinating. How do we develop organizations that don't dehumanize us and turn us into cogs in a wheel and keep thwarting that life satisfaction? There's a good example right here in Ann Arbor of a company that does that, and that's called Zingerman's. Zingerman's has a mission statement that was organically developed by the employees of Zingerman's. It's pretty amazing. When Ari Weinzweig and uh, Paul Saginaw decided to build a mission, they didn't bring in some marketing company who then, and then they went off to some little golf event for a weekend and come up with some mission statement, come back and, and tell their HR group, oh, make sure everybody knows this mission. You know, we're going to have mission, uh, mission workshops. No, instead what they did is talk to all of their employees and say, why do you work here? Now, if you did that in your own school or in, your, in the hospital system or wherever you are in this university, you start asking people, and I've done this, you ask people who are secretaries, why do you work here? They will tell you some of the most amazing stories you've ever heard. It, it's really incredible. People all, almost everybody, has a mission that can be pulled from them if you just ask them. So. <laughs> Zingerman's mission is amazing, and this really was an organically developed mission. We share the Zingerman's experience for selling food that makes you happy, giving service that makes you smile in passionate pursuit of our mission, showing love and care in all our actions to enrich as many lives as we possibly can. You see that. And when you walk into the roadhouse, you see that mission right on the face of the person greeting you, on the people, well, on Ari, who's walking around pouring water for people. Ari, the founder, the owner, the multi-cazillionaire, um, probably, um, who, who walks around pouring water and says, do you have enough barbecue sauce there, Vic? And, uh, and cleaning up stuff from the floor. He actually wrote an article called Pouring Water, and it's all about giving back to the customer and actually serving the employee. He feels it's his job as the manager to serve the employee, because if, no one is, if the employee is not served, how can the employee possibly serve 
uh, his or her customers. Quite an amazing story. So if you have all of these people working there, they all say, yeah, it's my mission. And they get the mission. They all get it at Zingerman's, even if you have a dung beetle bagel or a dung ball bagel. OK, so let's get back to this, because I'm going to close up now. Um, We've talked about these arrows pointing in this direction. We always think about our personal health decisions leading to various conditions that we might get, and those conditions related to morbidity, which are uh, then related to mortality. We can look at it this way, just graphically. So we see our behaviors relating to conditions relating to mortality or morbidity relating to mortality. What if we think about, if, if we're dealing with chronic disease in our country, and chronic diseases include depression and anxiety, but also diabetes and many other things that relate to some of the decisions that we make to some extent, relate to some extent to some behaviors we could engage in, rather than always scaring people with, uh, with messages, trying to encourage them to change, which I really think is kind of the last vestige of the incompetent communicator, quite honestly because I think people become inoculated to these kinds of scary messages. Let's try to reverse the arrows. Let's think about trying to anchor a person's life with a purpose. Let's think about how we could help a person develop purpose, develop a mission. And that could be an individual purpose. It could be a family purpose. It could be an organizational purpose. It could be a world purpose. That's fine. The idea, though, is to have a, to have a self-transcending purpose in your life. Then where do these behaviors go? These behaviors lead to greater energy to give you a mission or a purpose in your life. So let's think about the arrows going in that direction. Now, by the way, for the last year and a half, I've been studying the data looking at what behaviors actually give you more energy or vitality. And there's a form called the SF36. This stands for short form 36, there are 36 measures. And part of this includes uh, a whole area called vitality. So if you look epidemiologically at all the data, all the behaviors that seem to relate to vitality, here's what we find. There are five things that seem to really relate to vitality. One is sleep. We don't get enough sleep in this world, right, in, in this society. Sleep is very important. So sleep eight hours a day if you can. Presence or mindfulness is very important. Meditation, remember the Elizabeth Blackburn study. Meditation, but also things just walking in a park, trying to observe things. If you're washing dishes tonight, think about washing the dishes only. Try not to multitask. Just focus on washing those dishes. Feel the warm soap in your hands. And Jerry would say, yeah, I wish you would think about that more. <laughs> but um, you know, start thinking about the pre being present in things that you're doing that you normally wouldn't. Think about how you put your shoes on. Think about changing that for a second. How about when you walk in the shower? You put soap on where to begin with? I don't want to know. But let's say you start here. And then try changing that, putting it on here first. Just do something to break this up. And you'll become more present, more mindful. That gives people more vitality. Think about physical activity. More physical activity is good. It gives you vitality. We know that. Creativity, it turns out, gives you more vitality. And there are a number of Swedish studies that have shown where they gave free tickets to the opera, to jazz, to you know, a lot of musical or, or gallery events. They found that even attendance at creative things increases your vitality, your energy. And then finally, we know that eating well increases your vitality. And I don't have time to get into all of this, but the, the idea would be rather than eating enormous meals that give you the this great big jolt of glucose, and then suddenly, an hour later, you have, you know, the, the glucose spike has gone down to nothing, and you're going, God, I feel so tired, and I'm also hungry again. I can't believe it. Try eating smaller snacks or smaller uh, meals. You know those bars out there, those energy bars. Pick up one or two of those and take them with you today, and don't eat as big a lunch, but eat an energy bar in between breakfast and lunch and in around 3 o'clock or so, and see how you feel. See if you feel differently. When you're home and you feel like having a glass of scotch or a glass of wine or something because you're tense and you need to chill a little bit. And I totally get that because I do that. But instead, try going home and working out just a little bit. T try taking a walk. See what happens to you. You might be more vital. Rather than being there, you may think you're present at the dinner table, but you're not. You're reading the paper. You're listening to NPR. You're doing something, but you're not there. You're not there with your family. You're not present. So think about how some physical activity at the end of the day rather than the beginning of the day might help you. I put all these together to form this little moniker called space. Just give yourself space. Sleep, presence, activity, creativity, and eating well. 
So to close up, we talked about this frog and how do we get the frog out of the boiling pot. William James, who is one of the fathers of psychology, but he started as a philosopher. He was a philosopher and a psychologist uh, in the 1800s, said to change one's life, start immediately. Do it flamboyantly. No exceptions. I'd say that still holds. But I have an even better ancient philosopher and haiku artist's uh, haiku about this. Basho, in the 16th century, said, into the ancient pond, a frog jumps, water sound. Into the ancient pond, our lives, our civilization, our family, a frog jumps. A frog decides to jump out of the, that water that's gradually boiling to change their life. Water sound. Suddenly, you change. Your family changes. The University of Michigan changes. And society changes. Thank you. Uh, I can answer any questions if you want, even dung beetle biology. Yes, sir. First of all, I'm really grateful that you gave this talk and have reached so many people through it, which brings me to the question, what does the literature say about gratitude? I know personally, listing 50 things a day that I'm grateful for helps me to connect to people that have given me stuff and have helped me in my own purpose by seeing their purpose in their lives. Um, and so is there literature on, on the role of gratitude in terms of those things Related to vitality and the SF36. It's an absolutely wonderful question. Do you know the hormone cortisol? Cortisol is called the stress hormone in our bodies. You don't want too much cortisol. You need some, but you don't want too much. Um, what a woman named Stephanie Brown found uh, while she was here at the University of Michigan is that people who gave to charities, people who exhibited gratitude, actually uh, had reductions in cortisol levels as a result of those activities. If you want your stress hormone, which causes heart disease and all sorts of other problems, to, uh, uh, to lower, think about what you could do, what charity organ charitable organization you could engage in. Think about gratitude. Now, if you need a little just a reminder or something, I have a little gratitude app that's on my cell phone. If you just go to your iPhone app store, or whatever, if you happen to have an iPhone, there's a gratitude app. And every day you write down what you're grateful for. I couldn't agree more. It's a wonderful comment. And it really does fit, I believe, very strongly in this idea of self-transcendence. You are transcending when you are more grateful to other people. Thank you. Victor. Thank you. Yes. Great question. Yes, John Graydon. Vic, I'm also grateful. Thank you. And thanks to everyone else for being here because we need voices. I was sitting back there really learning and then simultaneously thinking about the symbolism of today. Much of what you're putting forth overlaps with a perspective that also had roots at the University of Michigan. Chris Peterson was a right. voice for that, yes. his memorial services today. And I think if we could do some things that would allow your messages to come through rather than waiting for events that are somewhat tragic to mobilize us to do things, it would be a nice take-home message. Chris Thank Peterson was one of the fathers of positive psychology, and he wrote a book recently with a person named Martin Seligman, who's the other father of positive psychology, called Character, Virtues, and Strengths. Um, he, is, he was a phenomenal person, uh, and I was blessed to uh, have the chance to get to know him over just the last year, because as I was writing this book, I, I kept uh, thinking about Chris's work. Yeah. And I think that we have a loss at this university, but your message today balances that with a gain for everybody here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Yes. I'm actually from Chris's department, the Department of Psychology, and some of my work uh, actually relates and draws from the work that he did. Um, you didn't talk very much about how you really can change the systems. And my uh, current thinking in the work I'm doing is trying to change systems, especially the classroom environment that if you know of uh, Saul Khan's work, he right. just came out with a wonderful book called The One World Classroom, when he talks about how we need to do that. Could you share some ideas, thoughts about how to change the system? Well, I was going to mention that 
I've been teaching in an experimental classrooms over in Mosher, Mosher Jordan that are designed by Steelcase. But I gave a talk to staff in our department last winter and tried to pull a lot of those notions into what can be done to change the working environment as well and got tremendous interest. A lot of people came to talk to me. And basically what I learned is that our university in its bureaucracy has all kinds of ways to prevent that from happening. For example, we know from lots of research that if you can stand as well as sit some of the time, and we have a couple of people who actually now have their offices equipped with higher desks, yeah. the only way you can do that is if you dis have disabilities and can prove you or need if it. you're a higher level administrator probably you know. right yeah <laughs> but which I mean, is crazy and yeah. and, and the I'm other with you we have tons of research coming out more and more showing about attention span we know about the 80 20 rule where we're very efficient maybe one day of the week if we look at the whole thing 20 hour uh, out of a 40 hour week and so forth and if we could find ways to give people a lot more breaks or other ways to change what they're doing shortly, they will actually be more productive. Yeah. And yet we have all kinds of systems and rules that don't allow for this. So these are just some examples of I, I think we as a university really should take this on. Because to me, it affects everything like one's sense of uh, competence, whether you feel you have some control over what you do, and, uh, and connection to a mission. And connection to a mission, which fits it very nicely. Carol Dweck at Stanford right. has also one of my written heroes. a lot. She's a good friend of mine. I've worked with her one of my heroes. over the years as well. And uh, we have all this, and we're not using it even, even here at our university for students or for the workplace. So that would be my point. If anything can come out of this, how can we start to try to change the system in some positive ways? Well, thank you so much for uh, bringing that up. I couldn't agree more, and I would love to use this. If this became, some, to some degree, a spark that generated that movement, it has to come from the leaders in this university, quite honestly. And the leaders that I know, I don't believe would be opposed to this. There's some sort of machinery that goes on, though, here that, that messes that up, and that is called a bureaucracy. And it's exactly what Max Weber warned us about. Uh, he said we would suffer alienation and ennui. Emil Durkheim said we'd are killing ourselves, and he wrote a book called Suicide that was all about this alienation that we experience. So we need to do something in the place that we spend most of our awake time in, period. So anything we can do, thank you. Uh, any other questions? We had a few questions that came over from the forum. Great. And the first question is, I get everything you said, but how do I find the balance and not feel guilty for having to maintain my own healthy mentality in life? Maybe the person is saying, every once in a while, I really want to be Charlie Sheen. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I am totally with that, by the way. <laughs> I just think every once in a while, you know, thinking about uh, things that bring you tremendous uh, joy that may not be these, you know, standard intrinsic values may be fine. I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I do think there needs to be um, this balance, but I actually think the balance can be part of your daily activities, quite honestly, part of your work. Um, I know for me, I'll just give you my own personal experience, and my wife can uh, say, well, Vic, you sometimes do those things and you sometimes don't, because it's absolutely true. But I try now to meditate more regularly. I certainly work out very regularly. I try to work to work when I can. I can incorporate that into my life. Now, I'm lucky because I live in the Burns Park area, so I can. But I try to um, uh, eat better. So in terms of eating smaller meals more frequently, I try to engage in that. I try to be creative. The pieces of this um, presentation are being developed as a graphic novel that I'm writing. And um, so that, for me, is a creative endeavor, kind of you know my own narrative that I, I wanted to tell. And I bought this little Zayo uh, sleep model monitor that attaches to my forehead at night, and I can monitor my sleep to see how well I sleep. I also have a 
Nike Fuel Band, which is, and by the way, I'm not paid by any of these people to endorse these, believe me. But this Fuel Band can tell me how many uh, steps that I've walked today. It also is a nice watch. It doesn't look terrible either, so I can easily keep this and put it on instead of a watch. It has a Bluetooth to a health coach. These are things that allow me to manage a very, very busy schedule and at the same time get these five things, give myself space in my life. But it's all driven. It's not driven just to, do spe to engage in space. It's driven because of purpose that I have. Yes, in the back. As you know, you know, a lot of health behaviors start in youth. And I'm wondering, how do we get kids to have that sort of sense of purpose, especially as their egos are developing and they're very self-centered? And, and does that make a difference? Is there research that looks at children's health behaviors and also behaviors in school or focus in school and a greater sense of purpose? Fabulous question, Terry. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I should point out that purposes change over a life course. So um, I've been speaking to retirees associations a number of times lately. And as you retire, very often people lose their purpose. And they need to gain a new purpose. That's what Simone de Boivier said. Um, children absolutely need a purpose. And there are a number, quite a few studies with kids, especially teenagers, uh, helping them develop a stronger purpose in life and also finding that kids who don't have a purpose have all sorts of problems. So it's absolutely imperative to do that. I'm working right now on an iPhone and Android app, hopefully to be used by kids and teenagers, um, that uses a lot of these kind of metaphorical creatures to help you identify your core values and develop a purpose in your life. I, I, we don't have interventions like that right now, but I actually think that that might be something that could lead to healthier behaviors later on. There's one neat study that just came out in because uh, I was in China recently, and it was with Chinese kids who play too many video games. And they sure enough found that kids without a purpose played inordinately more video games than kids with a purpose. Wired Magazine, for some reason, has shown a real interest in this area. And they're probably going to be doing an article on this in the May or June issue of Wired, mainly for these young techies who have kind of lost their purpose in life. They don't have one. We're becoming increasingly a nihilistic kind of society. And, and I think we need interventions to help build this up. So thank you for your question. We have another question. You spoke about self-actualized people in Maslow. Are there grounds in his theory that dismiss those who looked into self-actualization of humanity in a negative way? For example, Hitler. Yeah, oh, that's a wonderful question. So one might easily argue lots of people have strong purposes in their lives who are doing evil things. And uh, you know, a, person, a, psycho, a, psych, a philosopher named Todd May wrote a wonderful article um, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11 about meaning in life. And he said that, to some extent, a real purpose or meaning uh, needs to be something that you subjectively aspire to, but at the same time, objectively is important. And one might argue in that case that Hitler had uh, you know, something of reverse importance. Of, of disastrous and deleterious effect. So he did not have a true purpose or meaning in his life, one might argue. Yes, Brian. I, I appreciate the message you're bringing. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the relationship between purpose and planning, or maybe lack thereof. I'm just reflecting on my own experience, particularly as an instructor, how we are often taught um, to plan very carefully about what we're going to say to our students about the messages that we want to think. And yet I've found that the, the, the messages, the classes that have gone most powerfully are often the ones that are more an improv uh, experience in which some spark gets the whole room thinking and about a purpose, about wow. where we're trying to go as, in that day and seeing where we go from there. And how do we, how do we find that balance between wow. planning and improv? That is so interesting. So it sounds like the improv was coming from your heart and the planning was coming from your head. And suddenly what was coming from your heart was uh, resonating far more with the students. A couple of things. Getting back to um, presence. I now ask all of my students to close their computers down before I speak. Um, and I really insist on that because I want everybody focusing on me 
and I want to be focusing on them. I don't want to watch them staring into a computer when I think, are they on eBay right now? And you know that they are. So, uh, so I want presence in the classroom. The other thing is I love a flow state where suddenly something goes off kilter. Maybe someone dis really disagrees fundamentally because they had a different experience. Everybody has a narrative. Often people have a trauma story. And if you open in the classroom as an environment to allow those stories and share the stories, you will learn more, in my opinion. And the class will flow. I mean, there's a wonderful book called Flow, and I think people get into this flow state. And then, and then suddenly it doesn't feel like a Lutheran sermon I had to sit through, which felt like three months and it was only half an hour. It suddenly felt like nothing. Time just moved like that. On the other hand, you do have things that you have to say. You have to plan things out. So obviously there does need to be a balance. I can't tell you exactly how to engage, you know, how to do that balance for you. I do know that my own purpose, one part, of, I have two parts of my personal purpose. One is to give other people a purpose in life. You might, duh. Um, that's one thing. And by the way, that was Viktor Frankl's purpose too. Um, the second is to teach my students as if they're my children. So when I see a student now, I try to put my child into that student and say, how would, my, how would his or her parents be thinking about this interaction I'm engaging in? You know, would they appreciate the fact that I say, oh, I don't have time for you right now? Or I'm going to just read from my lecture notes. Or I'm going to have 1,500 PowerPoint slides with bullets and bore the crap out of you. You know? <laughs> First of all, for $50,000 a year, that's not a very good message. But second, if we really were teaching our children or teaching our students as if they were our children, we wouldn't be doing that. We'd be teaching in a much deeper, more fundamental way that comes from the heart. Even if we're teaching physics, we'd be teaching through stories, through other things. We'd be working with the person to solve problems, solve the formulas, understand them, and not just rote memorize. So that's, that's kind of a, a poor answer to a complicated, great question. Hi, Vic. Uh, Alan Tate, Anesthesiology. Hi, Alan. Um, How are you? One of the problems around the world is poverty. Um, and we could argue that many of these uh, individuals, uh, their Maslow's hierarchy of needs have not been met. Right. Um, now, you did say that there are some individuals who are able to overcome that and have some purpose in life without having all those needs met. But how do we do that as a, as a, as a group to help the, those? Because we know that poverty is associated with a lot of health issues. That's a wonderful question, Alan. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I don't, I'm not going to presume to be the expert at that. I will say I've thought about it quite a bit. And I'd say there are two facets of it. One is for people who can help more, who can provide help to people who are in need. That is a very strong mission or purpose in one's life, to, to engage in that, to engage in charity. That's, that's very powerful. So these people can think about something other than the hunger in their stomachs. The second is um, I still do believe, and this may be Pollyannish, I'll be honest about that, I still believe that people uh, in all walks of life can develop a purpose in life. And when you look at the data, looking at like cocaine or substance abuse addicts who then start developing a purpose, and remember, Having a purpose is part of a 12-step program. Now look at the socio-demographics of people in 12-step programs like Alcoholics Anonymous. It's across the board. People come in and then they start building a purpose in their life. And that may be if they have nothing else. And that may drive them forward. It may motivate them. Now that's about as much as I can say about that because there's no data that I could presume to be an expert in. But th that's my thinking so far. I would not reject this as being an upper middle class phenomena that people who have all those rungs or, or you know layers of the pyramid can only entertain. I really think this is more and, and should be ubiquitous in our society. Yes. Hi, my name is Julie Tumbarello. Um, I just want to thank you for this talk and share a personal story. Um, in 2002, I was diagnosed as being bipolar and spent the next six years in and out of hospitals. And during that time, you know, I was the frog in the boiling water. And wow. after about six years, um, really started to try to get myself out of the boiling water. And I read Ram Dass, um, yeah. Viktor Frankl, um, Eckhart Tolle was actually the sure. first person I read and really helped me. And I meditated. And and um, I got myself out of the boiling water. I mean, I've been off wow. medication for four years now. 
um, through this journey. And now I'm the frog out of the water, and hopefully my next purpose is to help other frogs get out of water. So I just wanted to thank you for this because this is the first time I've heard this presented um, in such a, a great way in this kind of audience. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's thank you. And maybe, maybe we should stop with that because that's such a lovely story. And thank you so much. And thank you all for your time.